most of what you will learn will not be in PA school. Okay, most of what you will learn will not be in PA school. PA school only scratches the surface of medicine. Okay? Hey guys, hi, I'm so sorry guys. I'm so sorry that I'm late. Just had some technical difficulties. Welcome to eShadowing everybody. Hope you guys are having a great week. Um, no, eShadowing, there's always eShadowing unless I announce that there is no eShadowing. So um, sometimes I'll be running late. Okay, so we'll just jump right into it. So of course I'm um, going to be hosting and presenting the uh, case study today and have another fun case study as usual for all of you. Um, so we're going to first start off with some questions for a few minutes. If you guys don't mind that we're going to clearly go over time, um, it's going to go a little past eight o'clock if you all are okay with that, but it's going to be another fun filled session. Okay, anybody have any questions to start off with? I'm just trying to, whether it relates to the emergency room, um, to e-shadowing, I mean, to the emergency room, to being a PA, anything. I don't really answer e-shadowing questions, um, anything about like receiving certificates and all that, because I've answered them plenty of times and everything is on the website. Um, yes, everybody gets to do, um, get a certificate, but everything is on the website, eshadowing.com. So I don't want to waste too much time um, answering questions relating to e-shadowing. So we're going to just focus on just PA stuff. What was your favorite rotation? Um, of course, the emergency room. <laughs> ER was my favorite rotation. That's why I, um, when I found out that I loved it, it was my what, third rotation, I think. My first one was internal medicine, which I was in the ICU at the time. Um, my second one was, I think ER was my second one. I honestly don't remember, but I know that ER was my favorite. I ended up doing um, my electives also in the ER. And then for my family medicine, I did urgent care. So anything to like treat like acute type of cases, acute and like broad cases, broad or a variety of cases, I should say. Um, so yes. How do you make the most out of every day? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that because when you're working and it's such a big ER and you know, you have so much to do, you don't even think about your day. Um, I don't think I start to think about my day until um, like probably because I work, you know, the night shift 7 p to 7 a.m. Well, I was or 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. So I don't start thinking about, oh, my gosh, it's so crazy. Oh, my gosh, isn't that until it actually dies down. It comes so busy, like just running around. What was the most challenging part of PA school for you? The most challenging was probably having to adapt to, um, you know, really, really, really trying to learn the material. I feel like. A lot of us just kind of um, go by with, um, you know, studying just to get an A. And that's not, you know, as I always say, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is learning to actually know what you're learning, um, to actually know what you're reading and um, retaining information because you're going to actually be practicing this one day. Well, not just practicing, but um, applying it on real people. And you can't be messing with people's lives. So you got to take your education serious once you actually start um you know, get into PA school. In the ER, you don't have to work a full five days a week um, or a, you don't work eight hours, which sucks. You work longer hours, but you work less days. So you'll work 10 or 12 hour shifts. If you work 12 hours, typically you'll work um, three days a week. If you work uh, 10 hours, you'll typically work four days a week. So if you work tw uh, 12 hours, that's 36 hours a week instead of 40, but um, they consider that full time. So I usually work well when I was working my regular life <laughs> when I was working my regular life before New York I was usually working um the 10 hours four days a week and then you have to work either every other weekend or at least two weekends a month and of course you can switch you have co-workers that are um would, are great a lot of them are nice to switch with you if you need to or to work a day for you and whatever so what are your thoughts on getting patient care hours as a scribe versus a cna so a, a scribe is great but the only thing with the scribe is that a lot of um a lot of schools don't recognize this as hands-on direct patient um, care hours so they may not count it i'm not sure if schools have changed or if they're more receptive to uh to scribing but a lot of schools don't recognize that as you know hands-on. A lot of schools do, but some don't. So it, you have to uh, follow up with the school that you're interested in to see if they do count that as um, direct patient care hours. They might just count it as like healthcare experience. Um, but CNA is always a safe bet. I always tell people, do CNA because <laughs> it's quick, um, it's safe, you're getting direct hands-on experience, um, it's relatively inexpensive to take a CNA course, 
and boom, that's it. You don't have to question whether that counts as healthcare experience or not. So that's always one of the first ones that I, I recommend. Biggest mistake in the ER for you. Have I ever made a big mistake in the ER for me? Big mistake is killing somebody. And thankfully that's never happened. Um, I don't know what other mistakes I've made. Um, and I wouldn't say them. <laughs> if I did make mistakes, I wouldn't really tell y'all. <laughs> okay, I never make a mistake. I'm just kidding. I mean, you're going to make mistakes. Um, I, I would say, like, I don't think I've ever made a mistake. So I'm not even going <laughs> to. Okay, what was the most challenging part of Pace? We'll answer that. Our answer taught me hours. How to find your learning style and study strategies before PA school. Before PA school, man, I was just, uh, um, I was so bad. I would just, um, before the test, I would, um, what's that word? Um, I would not learn as I should. I would like learn and dump and I would study last minute. I was just bad. Like I just don't take after me. After PA school or during PA school is a whole nother story. I really, really try to learn and study. <laughs> Some people are just kind of, kind of gets. I, not to say I, don't, I didn't study. I of course did study. I mean that's how I got to where I am. But like a lot of the information, I didn't remember them unless it was really interesting. Like I really like microbio. I've always liked microbio. I've, I've liked anatomy. I liked anatomy and physiology before PA school. And a lot of the stuff is also like the type of professor I have. If I really like the professor, if I really think that they're good at teaching, then I'll take it more serious. If not, and I'm just like, you know what? They're not even a good teacher. I'm going to just try to like, you know, do what I got to do to get an A and then boom. Now, I'm not talking about PA school. I'm talking about before PA school. So that was the question that was asked. So I, like I said, while in PA school, completely different learning style. I took my learning a lot more serious. I was um, studying a lot more. I was... Um, you know, developing different methods. I, I did had my own, you know, little way of studying. I structured it and I did what? What age did you start PA school? Good question. I am right now, I'm 30. I started PA school when I was 23. I graduated at 25 and it's got to be five years. <laughs> August, we'll make it August 20. I, got, I graduated either August 19th or August 22nd. So August 22nd, we'll make it five years that I've been a PA. So I graduated PA school at 25. And there's no specific age to be a PA. Most students in a PA school are around my age or were around. They're, they were like in their mid to late 20s, which is like kind of the age that I started. So there, But there's no actual age. You can go to PA school at 89. <laughs> so as long as you have a functioning brain, you can go to PA school. Thoughts on getting a D and retaking a class? Uh, definitely think you should, you should retake a class if you got a D on it. Um, but more personal questions, e um, email or DM me. Do you recommend study groups or do you prefer studying alone? I prefer studying alone, but if you do well with groups, then definitely do a, um, do a, a study with a, a group. But make sure, don't really study with like friends or people you know that'll, you know, you'll have too much fun with because then you're not gonna focus on study, you're gonna be talking. Um, unless you guys are that disciplined. Um, so I didn't, I, yeah, I just studied, I like to study by myself. So I, I studied by myself. I don't recommend, well, I wouldn't do it with friends. Did you take a gap year? I always get asked this question about gap years and whether I recommend it. Um, that's all up to you guys. Of, um, if you feel like you need a gap year, you apply when you're ready. So I can't say whether I recommend it or not. You apply when you're ready. If you're not ready for PA school, there'll always be PA school, okay? PA school will always be around. So make sure that you're mentally prepared, that you have the grades together, your, your staffs together, your patient care hours, all of that um, ready for, you know, for what's to come. And if that means taking a gap year, great. I think I got year. I think that's what it was because um, I graduated. And that's only because I had no choice. I kind of had to take a gap year because um, I found out that I wanted to be a PA my uh, senior year, like fall 2012. And so PA school applications opened up um, April 2013, spring 2013. And that's and that was like around the time that I found out I wanted to be a PA. So I um, had to get all my, you know, do, do my GRE, all of that. I already had patient care hours. So I had to, you know, shadow and all that. So I, I basically had to take a gap year because I didn't have everything together. And yeah, so I graduated. And then I, uh, while applying to PA school, I graduated and I was still applying to PA school. And then I started PA school that next spring, May 2014. So I graduated 2013, started PA school 2014. Instead of, I did not start PA school right after I graduated. So I guess a gap, not doing a gap year would be starting PA school, like graduating May 2013 and then starting PA school like August 2013.
but that's that wasn't the case for me. So yeah. if you have to take a gap year, take a gap year. There's no no wrong in taking gap years. I feel like um, that's what non-traditional students have to do anyway. Yes, some of your courses, right? Some of the courses have expired, but if you're a non-traditional student, that's probably going to be the case. Yes, you can't take too much time. I think typically it's ten years that you have to take your classes. So if, but that means you'll still have time anyway. So if you're a college student and you took a class freshman year and applying your um, senior year, so that's already like. Three, three, four years that's last. Um, so you have a few more years. But yeah, your classes do expire, um, which sucks. Because <laughs> a lot of times those classes are not even that relevant to what you're going to learn in PA school, but that's for another day. Um, so you don't want to waste too much time. Of course, you don't want to waste more than 10 years or more than five years, but um, have a good time frame. I think a, a gap year is what? A gap year, one year. <laughs> So, so take that time off to get yourself together and be well prepared. What are the working hours for a PA? Um, I think the standard 40 hours a week. Of course, that's going to vary. As you said, if you're in surgery, you may work more because you're going to be on call. If I think orthopedists, P, ortho, orthopods, ortho PAs, they work a lot. Um, it seems like they work a lot more with friends that I know that are in ortho. They have crazier schedules, especially when they're on call. It'll be like a 24 hour call, um, but standard, if you're in the office, 40 hours. Um, sometimes they go home early on Fridays. Like I said, if you're in the ER, it's 36 hours. How well did you feel PA school prepared you for working as a PA? I get asked this question a lot also. So most of what you will learn will not be in PA school, okay? Most of what you will learn will not be in PA school. PA school only scratches the surface of medicine, okay? Though, They'll have you, um, you know, they'll polish you and have you kind of ready to, you know, be out there. But as far as like, you know, being able to, you know, go like this, being on your feet, it just all comes with time. Okay. This all comes with, you know, getting comfortable, getting proper training and repetition, doing it. You know, if you go to work every single day and you're seeing, you know, a lot of similar cases or the same type of cases, or, you know, you develop a structure, you do it every single day, it's going to become like muscle memory. So you're going to get more comfortable. So that's not going to happen after one year in PA school and, you know, doing ortho one week then doing OBGYN the next week and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. So, you know, you're never going to be fully prepared. 90% of what you will learn will be out there when you get out there. So, and that's not to say you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to feel like you're prepared, but you are, you will be prepared enough because as I said, a lot of what you learn will come with that training that you get and just learning to do the every the, you know this or i'm not gonna say the same things every day but learning to do a specific you know type of um you know uh whatever training daily if you know what i mean i hope you guys get what i'm trying to say but the point is that you're never gonna feel like you knew everything when i started in the er i felt completely lost i felt like i didn't know anything but you do know you know enough you know enough to get by as like like what I show you guys with the case studies, if you have your basics down, you're gonna be fine. If you know that, oh my gosh, I'm in the ER, I gotta think of the worst thing possible. I gotta think of all my you know, terrible diagnoses and roll them out. And, and you know, the tests to order to roll them out and doing this to order to roll them out, then you're gonna make it. If you know what to do, and that's what PA school does. They set you up with the foundation, with the basics, and then boom. And then as you go on, you're gonna get more comfortable. You're gonna know how to interpret crazy labs, what to do when you get crazier labs. Um, who to consult, you know, doing this and that just by developing that structure and, you know, kind of that muscle memory. How do you retain the overwhelming amount of information that you learn in PA school? Um, I don't know. I think everybody can do that, <laughs> can retain information. You, It's weird because you're going to think that, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not going to be able to know all of this, but it's definitely going to come to you. It's, you know, you're going to be able to, to do it. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to answer, but you're going to be able to. And working in the, in the ER is really hard because you have to know so much of so many different things i honestly don't know how to how you end up retaining it but it just comes to you you just like develop a, a method and I, don't, I honestly don't know i mean think of you know all the information doctors have to know down to like the cellular level so y'all just some smarty pants i mean a lot of you i look at and i'm just like how do you even know this already and you're not a pa so our pa starting to gain autonomy pas already have you know a level of autonomy they're pretty autonomous I would like to think. How do PA programs view internship experience? I'm not sure what you mean by that. What internship experience would be? It depends on the specific. I don't think that there's there's really nothing negative when it comes to your education, I think. Like 
there, uh, I don't know what you mean by that because an internship is a good thing, right? That you that you went the extra mile to do this. So I don't think they'll view it as, as negative. What pre-PA activities slash job did you do? And speaking of also internship experience, uh, like I always say, PA schools want you to be well-rounded. So if you did an internship in something completely different from healthcare, that's fine. Anything that's adding to your education, I don't see them wrong in that. So if internship is adding to your education and your academic performance and just, you know, your resume, I don't see anything wrong in that. So I don't see why they would look at it as something negative. So before PA school, I was in LPN. Uh, that's how I got my healthcare experience. I um, work at a nurse, work at a nursing home. So that's what I did. I also for for volunteer work, I no no um that's no surprise. I worked with Big Brothers Big Sisters or volunteered with Big Brothers Big Sisters. I also did an internship with Big Brothers Big Sisters. So that's also what I mean by schools can't like. You know, there's no wrong in doing an internship if, if you know, want to. Because I did one my senior year with Big Brothers and Sisters, as I said. I've always loved mentor mentorship. So that's why I did it. I've been doing mentorship since high school. Um, Big Brothers and Sisters is an organization um, where you have a little sister that you mentor. Uh, I actually still have to do it now. I have a little sister right now. And you just kind of guide them. You help them with whatever they may need help with. You guys can do like little activities. You guys can meet up. Like I think they recommend it um, twice a month, but I usually do more. Uh, right now, you can choose to do Big Brother Big Sisters, but right now they're doing it online, virtual only due to COVID. So I just you know go on, see my sister, we chat, um, we we would et cetera, et cetera. You know, it'll be a little sister. They'll be like in middle school or elementary school. Typically, like middle school, I've always had. I typically have had middle schoolers, but you can also have those in elementary school. That's how I got mine, a lot of my uh, volunteer hours. Um, let me see. And then um, I was part of some organizations, and so if they would do an event or something like that, I got volunteer hours that way. Yeah, with, as a PA, you can volunteer, not volunteer, you can work in multiple specialties at once. So if I have, you know, I have a friend that does ER and OBGYN um, on the side. You can do ortho and emergency medicine, have two jobs, two different locations, wherever you want, as long as you can make it to work, Boom. Yes, behavioral tech count as healthcare experience. Yeah, behavioral health is um is still people don't confuse behavioral health with not being medicine medical. Behavioral health is mental health, which is medicine. So yes, behavioral health tech um great way to get healthcare experience as well. How hard is it to switch specialties as a PA? Not hard at all. You can do it as you please. <laughs> all right. If you have more questions for me, then just let me know. Send me a DM or send me a dm or email all right don't pay attention to that date that date's from last week this is a new case study i don't know any pa's that practice in houston i do know dallas but okay all righty so emergency room guys er we're gonna jump right into it fun case study again all right so in the ER, what is it that I always tell you guys to prepare for in the ER or to know in the back of your head with every patient that you're dealing with? It was just on slide two. <laughs> yes, good job, guys. Yes, awesome. All right, so this is what some, um, someone was saying about being able to retain a lot of information. So when you have your basics down, when you know the fundamentals, when you know how to take a history, when you know how to take a physical, when you know how to... Um, what labs to, not even you don't even have to have to know what labs to order yet because that won't come to you. But when you know when you have a structure and you know what to do or um, questions to ask or what to be thinking, then you're gonna get everything else down packed. Or when everything else, or when you start actually learning the diseases and the labs associated with them and the tests associated with them, then it all you know it's all more simple because then you already know you know your OPP, your SDA, your history, your physical. Um, the worst first, the, the physical, when you learn your physical, you're going to learn um, about each body system and then you're going to be able to connect the disease with the body system so you know what to be looking for. So just getting the fundamentals down pat is what's important. So that's why I, you know, structure my PowerPoints this way. So you guys remember about the ER worst first. So when you actually learn all the diseases associated or emergent diseases um, associated with the ER, then you'll know to roll those out. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I know we did chest pain last week, but this is just to show you that 
a lot of different medical conditions can present the same or you know differently but it's a different diagnosis all right so a 68 year old male with history of hypertension presents with complaint of chest pain okay let's say he's been having chest pain the past week yes somebody asked me if you can have a session with labs today we have labs actually um so look at his vitals what stands out with his vitals or does anything stand out to you with um when you're looking at his vitals anything stand out to you anything look crazy yes good job everyone, everyone that said bp good job his blood pressure is extremely elevated yeah you can ask what their baseline blood pressure is but that's not really baseline you never want somebody somebody to be walking around a lot of these patients do it i'm not gonna lie they you know they may be walking around with blood pressures like that but when they do they can even start to have symptoms that their blood pressure is you know super super elevated so you never want them to just have this as a baseline bp so um you so from seeing this the, these vitals you're already thinking of some questions to ask and you already know that oh his blood pressure is elevated so um what so seeing his blood pressure what's one thing that you can do next um or not even next or or that you can do while while you're about to go see him what's something that you can do like before you even see him or while you're about to go see him if someone's blood pressure is this high maybe like things uh your answers are coming in delayed okay somebody said ekg that's good but that's not what i'm thinking of he's already gonna have an ekg done way before you even see him all right so if it's typically if i see um that his blood pressure is this high i'll either um i'll ask the nurse to retake it or I'll just take it when I go in the room. <laughs> yes, good job, Lisa. I'll just retake the blood pressure. <laughs> so if it's still elevated, then that's when I give him, um, you know, something to help get his blood pressure down. So you never want the blood pressure to just stay like that. Yeah, you can ask him. If he, he could be due. Good job, really. He could be due for his medicine. If he comes to the ER at like 10 p.m., he's due for his... Okay, no, if he comes to the ER at like 8 p.m., and he's due for his blood pressure at 9 p.m. And then you're seeing him at like 11 p.m. Then it could be that he's just due for his medicine. But, you know, we don't know yet. So we're going to see. <laughs> All right. So remember, what, what is it that I taught you guys when I'm um, taking a, a history? What is it that I taught you guys? Or that maybe I didn't even teach you. Maybe you're, you already knew it. When asking about questions related to pain. What's the format? What is the format? Yes, 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 yes. O P P Q R S T A. O P P Q R. That's onset. The, when did your symptoms start? When did the pain start? He started having chest pain a week ago. P. Um, P is provocative factors. Um, anything makes the pain worse. Um, no, nothing. Well, actually, walking. You know, two blocks. No, walking, taking like. You know, a hundred steps makes it worse. I'm just thinking, you know, off the top of my head. Um, anything help relieve the symptoms? Mm, it seems to be really, you know, I take um, an aspirin, um, or it seems to go down after I take an aspirin. The quality of the pain. Can you describe the pain? That's what Q stands for. Can you describe the pain? Um, is it sharp, dull, achy? Um, it's a sharp pain. Um, radiation. Can you tell me where the pain is? The pain's right here on the left side of my chest. Does it radiate anywhere? No, it stays right here. Um, okay, so the pain is localized, not um, you know, it's not. It doesn't radiate, so it's local to his left chest. What is it? As I forgot, because uh, I just get this. Okay, T is timing. What time does it come on? Um, oh, so what is it? S? Symptoms or oh, whatever. T is timing. What time does it come on? Is it, is it constant or does it come and go? If it comes and goes, does it come on at a, at a specific time? Oh, yeah, S is pain scale. I never really, I'm not even going to lie, I never even really ask them about the pain scale. <laughs> no, actually, sometimes I do. But I really don't ask because it will already be there. The nurse will have already have it written down on their vitals. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I don't always ask because it'll be there a lot of times with their vitals. So, yeah, so S is the severity, scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it? Sometimes I ask that, but sometimes I don't. Um, I just know that, oh, he's in pain. So, and then T is timing. Is it constant? Does it come and go? Does it come by at any specific time? And then A is alleviating um, factors, or I think um, anything that make it better or worse. I think that's what A is. Um, but yeah, those are the main questions that I ask. And then um, 
I ask him, does he have history? Being that his blood pressure is elevated, I'll then go into asking him, sir, I noticed your blood pressure is really elevated. Um, and this is, um, I start taking his blood pressure. I'd be like, oh, do you have a history of high blood pressure? Do you take any medicine for high blood pressure? And then say, let's say he says, yes, I take lisinopril uh, once a day. Um, but I missed my dose. Okay, boom, he missed his dose. So um, we don't really give lisinopril in the ER because uh, we want to get his blood pressure um, down. We don't want to get his, it down too quickly, but you want to get or too low. But we give more medications that will kind of get it down um, a little quicker. So sometimes, and it depends sometimes what it is. Um, I'm not even going to get to naming too many of them, but there's amlodipine, clonidine, metoprolol, uh, labetalol. Um, what do you want to be... Um, what do you want to check before giving a patient certain blood pressure medications? What can interfere that we typically commonly check that can also um, be um, altered with when you lower their blood pressure? What can also go hand in hand with the blood pressure? No, not blood thinners. Blood thinners won't affect your blood pressure. Blood thinners can affect other blood thinners. What can affect your, um, what can affect a blood pressure medicine? Or what can a blood pressure medicine affect? That's a better way to look at it. Blood sugar? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. Heart rate. Good job. Yes, 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 yes. Heart rate. So a lot of these medications can also, these blood pressure medicine can also lower your heart rate. So you don't want to give a patient, if a patient's bradycardic, you don't want to give them something that can lower their heart rate because it's going to bottom out. I mean, they're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Blood, and then of course, if patients have kidney problems or if they have side effects, you know, you, you want to make sure that they're not allergic to it or that they can take the medicine. But heart rate, heart rate, heart rate, you want to make sure that their heart rate's not too low for that medicine. So, say we give them a, a blood pressure medicine, his heart rate is fine, you can give them, you know, really um, anything unless he's not allergic to it. Um, so, say I give him some, let's say, um, low to pain to get it down. Um, that's just, you know, when I came up with that at the top of my head. So then you're going to ask him his past medical history so you know that he does have high blood pressure. You can also ask if he has high, um, uh, if he's a diabetic, because those two are like best friends. <laughs> you will find that out. High blood pressure, hypertension, and diabetes are best friends in the ER. If somebody got high blood pressure, then most likely than not, they're also diabetic. It's not funny, but it's, you know, I just tend to make jokes out of stuff. But, okay, and then you ask them their past surgical history, family history. Like I said, a lot of times it's what will already be in the chart, so you'll know it coming in um, to interview the patient. Social history. So what's an important social history question that you want to ask this patient that can affect their symptoms or presentation or um you know, the course of things. What do you want to ask from the social history? That's always, always, always important. Yes, smoking. Who said it first? Lisa. Liza, Lisa. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Yes, smoking. Yes, smoking. Good job, guys. All right. So um, being that this guy's having chest pain, physical is going to be pretty easy. Listen to heart and lungs. For the heart exam, you want to listen to um, if he has any murmurs. You want to um, make sure that his heart rate is normal. If his heart rate is normal um, when you look at his, his vitals, but, you know, you also want to check, um, listen to his heart, make sure you don't hear any abnormal um, heart and lung sounds. And then you can also do a GI exam, but typically I don't unless they have GI stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, Janelle. So, we have our labs. I'm sorry, I did not mean to have lipase up there. <laughs> so, we have our labs. What lab is do you really want for this patient? You want a CBC, you want a CMP. With every lab that you order, there's going to be an indication for it, right? You want to order it for a reason. So, and I'll go over this with you guys when we go to look at the lab results, right? So, what do you want to order for this guy? You talked to him already, you um, did your physical, he told you all this stuff, he told you he has history of high blood pressure. Um, okay, back to the, okay, nobody said this question, but, um, We'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, what labs do you want to order? Okay, never mind. I'm, I want to talk about it now. Okay. So in the history, we asked his past medical history, right? Um, what's one important question that you have to ask in this past medical history for this patient? You look at the age, right? You look at the age. Remember words first, right? And it's my bad that I didn't, you know, bring this up. Even <laughs> so, you look at the age, sixty-eight. Look at the history, even the age, just the age alone should make you want to ask this question. But you look at the age, you look at his history, um, you look at his vitals, you look at his complaint. 
what do you want to know about his history? Even though, even if he tells you, you say, oh, any past medical history of this, right? Um, or do you have any, any medical problems? You would phrase it this way. Do you have any medical problems? Right? And he tells you. But for a lot of patients, if you don't ask specifically for something, they're not going to tell you. A lot of times I'll say, do you have any medical problems? They'll be like, no. Then I say, do you have a history of diabetes? Or do you ever have, have you ever had diabetes? Have you ever had high blood pressure? That's when they start telling you. <laughs> so you have to ask, if you're looking for something specific, you have to ask it. That's what I found out with patients. Cause you know, they don't know, they, you know, they don't know. So, and they don't know what to say. So if you don't ask, have you ever had a stroke? A lot of times they won't tell you. If you, don't, if you don't ask, have you ever had a heart attack? A lot of times they won't tell you. So if you're looking for something, ask about it because they won't tell you. Or, or if it's in their medical history already. So you ask this guy, have you ever had a heart attack? Do you have any heart problems? If they say they've never had a heart attack, ask if they have any heart problems. And make sure when you're asking questions for like important, important systems like the heart, like the brain, ask it in the most layman terms as possible like like really 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 get it down to the basics say heart or say something that they will, will understand don't say cardiac don't say neuro don't say like even if you say brain say like in your head i don't know sometimes it really you know helps to just kind of i'm not even going to say dummy it down but just ask them in a way that they'll understand. So you can say heart attack. Don't say, of course, you won't say cardiac history, but you can say, have you ever had a heart attack or have you, do you have any problems with your heart? Have you ever had any, um, been hospitalized for your heart? Okay, so we went through this. So what do you wanna, somebody actually already answered this question. What do you wanna specifically order for this patient? All right, so who said it first? Who said it first? Troponin, I think Fatima said it first. Good job, Fatima. Okay, so you so you want to order a troponin. This patient, it is very, very, very important that you order a troponin. And what is a troponin? Anybody know what a troponin is and why it's important? Anybody know what a troponin is? And also, um, I'm sorry, some questions I forget to, to mention to you guys because I'm just so used to them already being in the chart. A lot of the times their meds will be in the chart. Or if you if they tell you medical history, then you'll see, then you'll ask them, oh, do you take medicine for it? All right, measure cardiac function. Yeah, it just basically is a test to show if there's any stress to the heart. It can be an indication of a heart attack um, or, you know, damage to the heart. It's not, it, it's specific to the heart, but sometimes it can be elevated for other things such as kidney problems. All right, so troponin. But what other test would you order for this patient? What other tests would you order? So there's patients coming in complaining of chest pain. So you would order CBC, CMP, troponin. What other tests can you order? And a lot of times I won't order these two tests right away because um, they may not need it. But a BMP is basically similar to the CMP, except it doesn't have your liver enzyme. So BMP is the same as the CMP, basically. BNP, BNP, um, uh, whatever, BNP is good. Um, but you would only order that if you suspect that they could be, have heart failure or um, CHF exacerbation. He doesn't have any swelling in his legs. His um, physical exam is normal. Lungs sound clear. He has no history of heart failure. Yes, good job, Sarah. You would order um, some coags. You would order, order the PTT and PTINR. So PTT and PTINR is important because if the patient does have a heart condition, you know, a um, ACS going on, you want to, um, and you could, and you want to start them on any blood thinners, um, any antiplatelet medicine, then you want to um, check their um, clotting factors and make sure that they're okay to get those type of medications, that they won't bleed out or nothing. <laughs> so coags are important. Like I said, I don't always order coags because if I think that, you know, their troponin is going to be okay or that he may go home where I don't suspect that it's like in an acute heart condition, that like it's something acute where he they're going to need to stay in the hospital, then I don't order it initially. But then if say the troponin comes back elevated, then you add it on because that patient's going to need some type of anticoagulant or antiplatelet medication. Stress test is not done in the ER. Stress test is done once the patient is admitted. All right, what meds do you want to avoid and give? So this patient is complaining of chest pain. Remember I told you guys this last, last week, what is the best drug you can give this patient right now to help relieve their symptom? It's easy, or you can ask them if they took it. Remember this patient said he already took it or he takes it to help, he's been taking it to help with his pain. What is this drug? 
Yes, good job, Sohail. So you want to um, give that patient aspirin. So aspirin um, is part of the Mona. <laughs> then you guys will learn what Mona is today and in PA school. So aspirin is a great, great medication. It's an antiplatelet. Um, aspirin, um, typically your doctor will tell you to take a baby aspirin a day once you hit like age 65 and above um, or if you have any heart conditions. So uh, you typically, yeah, I said a baby aspirin, but in the ER, you give a full dose aspirin, which is 325 milligrams. Yes, you can give nitro um, after, but you want to just start off with a simple dose of aspirin. What imaging test is especially important to order slash do for this patient? What imaging test is especially important to order slash do for this patient? It's a simple imaging test. What do you want? Chest x-ray. Good job. Yes. Um, Sarah, um, he's, he's already going to have the EKG done. So yes, a chest x-ray. Simple chest x-ray. The chest x-ray will oftentimes, oftentimes come back before the um, labs. <laughs> it's really easy. So um, everything is stat in the ER. So they'll come, do the chest x-ray. He'll get this already. I'll just will read it like this and boom. So what do you see? So labs start coming back. We did our, okay, so let's, before we start going over labs, let's go over, the, you know, the whole case. This is a 68-year-old male with history. Because remember, you may have to present to your um, doctor, right? So you're going to be like, this is a 68-year-old male with history of hypertension, coming in of one week old, um, chest pain, localized to the left chest. Pain gets worse when he walks about 100 feet. Um, he takes asking for the pain that uh, does relieve the symptoms. Pain is uh, currently a uh, 8 out of 10 and goes down to a 3 when he takes his aspirin. Um, he does not have history of heart conditions. He does not have history of um, tobacco use. No family history of, um, of any heart conditions. He's never had a heart attack. Um, no low risk um, factors for PE. Um, he is um, EKG shows this and that. Um, you did review the EKG and um, the normal sign of the no ST changes, no S, no T wave inversions. Um, gave him an aspirin. He does feel you know slightly better. His blood pressure was elevated. We gave him some amlodipine, rechecked it. Now it's down to let's say it's down to one seventy five over seventy two. Okay, and the patient is stable. Um, on the monitor. Boom. Okay. <laughs> so that's how you present it to your doctor, to your attending physician. And, um, you know, so we're just pending labs. All right. So pending labs and chest x ray. Okay. So basically, you know, you're going to get all that down. So I know I went really fast. That was the point because you're going to be, you know, just spitting it all out. You're going to be, like I said, you're going to just end up memorizing a lot of this stuff. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So you're going to be basically presented to your doctor like that. And you're just saying that, oh, just pending labs and chest x-ray, do you want me to give him anything else while, you know, the labs and stuff come back? He's stable. His pain is down to a three right now after giving him the aspirin. And then we'll progress to his imaging and labs once they come back. So ding, ding, ding. Everything's coming back. Chest x-ray, what do you guys see? All right, what do you guys see with the chest x-ray? I'm sorry. I just realized that people raised their hands. Um, so next week, I'll have you guys um, come on live with me. I know it's towards the end of the session, but what do you guys see with the chest x-ray? No, um, somebody said information. No, there's no information. It's normal. <laughs> so there's different ways of reading a chest x-ray. Um, there's different methods. You guys will learn all of this, but you're going to look at um, the bones. You're going to, um, what is it? There's the A, B, C, D, E of reading a chest x-ray. Um, you start looking at, um, well, I look at bones. So I try to look at the bones first. And then I look at the heart. Well, I make sure it's an actual, actually a good chest X-ray, um, and that the patient is positioned right. That it's not too um, dark or too light. You guys will learn all those terms for it. Um, that the heart doesn't. No, the heart doesn't look enlarged. That the heart doesn't look enlarged, and it does not. That's if it's like greater than fifty percent of the um, the diameter. Um, and it looks fine to me. The the lungs are clear. You can see lung markings. Um, let's see what else. No, there's no new orthorax. You can see lung markings. All right. You'll get good. You'll, um, you'll take a radiology course. Um, sometimes you still don't know what you're looking at. That's why they have radiologists. <laughs> All right. And then EKG. So EKG, you'll have the EKG, as I said, way before, um, um, anything. Actually, it'll be the first thing that you see. And they have, they have to have an EKG done within five minutes of, you know, walking into the ER and saying, oh, I have chest pain. As soon as they say they have chest pain, they do an EKG. Because if that EKG um, shows ST elevation, boom, 
as soon as they can, they get to a doctor's room, okay? So if, they, if it shows like ST depression or ST um, T wave inversions or something like that, the doctor will like, you know, mark it off and then they'll be like triage should be seen earlier than later. But if it's reading STEMI or the doctor says, oh, this is a heart attack, the patient gets seen right away. So um, this is a normal EKG. I was trying to find an abnormal one, but I couldn't really find one um, with what I really wanted to show you guys. So when I, and I should have uploaded a picture of like the course of, uh, I, I don't want to say the, the diagnosis yet, never mind. <laughs> All right, so let's review the labs. All right, labs, labs, labs. So CBC comes out first. And with CBC, why do you want to do a CBC with a patient having chest pain anyway? Why do you want to do a CBC? What, what what can a CBC show you that can um, be a cause of chest pain? All right, just looking for one answer and then I'll explain it to you guys. What can a CBC show you that can be a cause of chest pain? Anemia, perfect. Yes, so hell. So if you're infection or inflammation, perfect. Yes, Bendu. Those were the two that I basically thought of. So um, you're going to look at the white count. You're going to look at the hemoglobin. Those are the two that I typically look at um, the most. Um, I also look at um, platelets, um, neutrophils um let's see lymphocytes especially for anything viral uh so white count if the white counts really elevated then the patient could have a pneumonia or could be developing a pneumonia or some type of infection um that's causing the chest pain if the patient's hemoglobin is four that can definitely be a cause of chest pain um so that's why the cdc is important as it relates to chest pain specifically and then while they're in the hospital they're gonna you know they just need basic labs e either way for a patient that all right cmp CMP, complete metabolic panel. Why is it, um, I'm sorry, I was just reading the comments. Why is this CMP important for chest pain? Well, why is the CMP important either way? If you're gonna order labs, you always wanna order a CVC and a CMP. Um, CVC, so why is the CMP important for chest pain? Just looking for a few answers. Um, let's see if you guys are thinking what I'm thinking. Why is the CV CMP important for chest pain? Plotting, no, sodium levels, yes, good. Electrolytes, perfect. Long. Perfect, perfect. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name or butcher your name. Electrolytes can cause chest pain. Okay, you look at the electrolytes. You look at um um you, um, you look at their their kidney function is not necessarily going to cause chest pain, but if their kidney function is not good, then they're not going to be able to get certain medications. And if their kidney function is also not good, then it could be a reason why their troponin is elevated. Um, let's see. As far as chest pain, lipid levels, no. CMP does not show lipid levels. You're going to have to order a lipid panel to look at, like, their cholesterol and all that. And then when, when a patient presents to the ER with, like, acute chest pain, they're not going to do a lipid level because you want to look at acute causes of chest pain. A lipid can affect that, can be a reason why you're having chest pain because you have really high cholesterol and um, your arteries are terrible because, you know, you eat bad. But acutely in the er we don't worry about lipid level all right so his cmp is basically fine chloride what 94 okay that's good <laughs> his cmp is great okay boom um troponin remember you guys said you order a troponin troponin comes back at 0.2 normal troponin is less than 0.040 it can vary with where you work sometimes they say less than 0 0.020 0 0.01 or 0 0.03 it has their little, you know, you know, variations, but anything less than 0 0.040. Um, and then labs will also have um, different types of troponins that they order, but or hospitals. But you'll see what's normal. You'll see what's abnormal. Anything abnormal is no good. So this guy's troponin is elevated. So what are you thinking now? What are you guys thinking? Right, 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 right. So um, when a if a troponin is mildly elevated, like 0 0.050 or 0 0.060, um, you know that could be you know some you know you know any abnormality is of course bad, not good. But if it's really really elevated, then that tells you no. <laughs> so this guy's troponin is pretty elevated. Um, and he doesn't have any kidney disease and he has chest pain, so you're thinking definitely something heart related. No, troponin is not gonna be um, elevated with a PE. I mean, it can be elevated with a PE, but then the D dimer will be elevated and then there'll be other stuff to tell you that so it's a PE. Remember I already said that this patient's low risk for PE. He um, scored negative on all the PE questions that I asked him that we didn't really ask, but I asked him because this is not a PE. <laughs> so um, yes, troponin is elevated. So, um, remember I said to do um, coags because coags are normal. All right, so this guy, 
what's next? What is next for this guy? He has an elevated troponin. He um, is having chest pain. He has high blood pressure. Um, he's old. Er, what do you want to do next? You gave him an aspirin already that brought the pain to a three. What do you want to do next? Send to cardiology. Good job. So um, this, the next course of action here, actually, before I go into that, we're going to go over emergent causes of chest pain again. So this guy has what's called acute coronary syndrome. Those are all emergent causes of chest pain. Um, but other causes, like I said, is PE, aortic dissection, um, a varices or a rupture, um, triple A, um, that's abdominal aortic aneurysm or rupture, uh, tension, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, gunshot wounds, chest trauma, endocarditis. These is not every single cause of chest pain, but really emergent common ones that you will typically see in your lifetime. Acute coronary syndrome typically gets admitted. Acute coronary syndrome falls under these three, okay? Either unstable angina, and STEMI, or STEMI. Which one do you guys think this patient has? Which one do you guys, you don't have to know what, um, like what each is or the characteristics of each, I'll explain. But what do you think, um, which one do you think it is and why? I'll explain, of course. I won't leave y'all hanging. Which one do you guys think it is? Good job, Miriam. Okay, so this guy is not unstable angina. Usually unstable angina is they have chest pain at rest, um, but their labs and everything look fine typically. Um, Unstable angina, if it's like their first time presenting, you can um, you can um, admit them and they'll start like aspirin or something. They'll be, you know, admitted, be seen by a cardiologist or be seen by the medicine team and um, ha eventually have a stress test. But it's not as like bad as STEMI. And it could be there's, you know, there could be, they could have some type of blockage. They may eventually need a stent, but it's like, so it's going from like worse to the worst <laughs> or or worse worse or worse or worse worse the worse worse or the worse i don't know guys i'm not an english teacher <laughs> so um unstable angina is you know they have chest pain at rest they have these risk factors their labs may look a little weird but their troponin is normal they have two negative troponins you'll do two trip you'll follow the troponin with all of these patients following the troponin means you order a troponin, then you order another troponin like three to four hours later, then you order another troponin. Um, so if it gets to the point where you order three troponins, typically they'll be admitted. Uh, in the ER, we order two troponins. Um, and if there's changes, then we admit them. If there's no changes and we discuss with the attending and whatever, and it's, it's not anything new, and you feel they're okay to go home, they can go home. But unstable angina is typically admitted. But when I say about, when I'm talking about the troponin and trending it, I just mean for all chest pains. All right, so NSTEMI is non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Um, it can be a normal EKG. It can be there's some EKG changes, but it's not showing an acute, like a heart attack. It's not showing a STEMI. Like the EKG will read STEMI or the doctor will mark off, oh, that this is a, a um, ST changes in this lead or that lead. So his EKG was fine. Um, T wave inversions can be an, an NSTEMI or um, if, there's no ST elevation, then it's not a STEMI because STEMI means ST elevation myocardial infarction. And STEMI is non ST elevation myocardial infarction. So if the, there's an elevated troponin, they have these race factors. Um, the story sounds like, you know, heart attack, um, pointing to a heart attack, then it's an N STEMI. The only thing is that the EKG hasn't, you know, shown it yet. So all of these patients will always admit. Or if if it's an unstable angina, if the labs are fine, but you're so concerned about this patient, um, then you will, you know, just try to sell it to the doctor. Tell the doctor, I really think this patient needs to be admitted. But typically, all of these patients, and, and STEMI, and STEMI, no questions about it. So did you guys understand that? I hope I explained it well to you guys. Let me know if you want me to explain it again. But I hope you guys, I hope I did a fine job. So we're going to go back a little bit. So these are the risk factors I was talking about. These are the most common risk factors for um, heart-related stuff. So age greater than 65, hypertension. HTN means hypertension. HLD means hyperlipidemia or um, you know cholesterol stuff. DM means diabetes mellitus or well, diabetes, <laughs> tobacco use. Previous history of MI or um, history of CAD, coronary artery disease, which means heart disease. Um, 
in family history. And STEMI is non-ST elevation, which means that the EKG is not showing a heart attack or there could be EKG changes, but it's not an ST elevation or ST changes. I, I should say it could be T wave inversion. T wave, T wave inversions typically precede ST elevation. So if you see a T wave inversion and they have an elevated troponin, I would, uh, you know, call cardio, let them know, and um, start likely anticoagulants. Okay, so as I said, NSTEMI is non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Like, so if they basically if they come in, they're gonna have the EKG done, right? Anybody coming in? Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to put pulmonary emboli. It's a, it's an NSTEMI. So if they come in, they have the EKG done, right? And uh, the doctor signs the EKG as no STEMI. The doctor, every doctor has to put no STEMI. This is a law, I believe. <laughs> but when you read an EKG, you have to put no STEMI. Okay, and you have to put, mark the time. If they mark no STEMI, but the patient comes back with an elevated troponin, they're having chest pain, and it's likely an end STEMI or some type of cardiac event that you want to make sure of that it's not going on, or an unstable angina or whatever. But for this guy, and STEM. Do these patients go to the cath lab? Good question. We're going to talk about that. All right. So um, Mona. Mona is um, what we learn in PA school, that you're going to give patients um, like the chest pain treatment. Um, so it's morphine, oxygen, nitro, ni or nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Mona. Okay. Um, you don't always have to do every single one of these. What I always typically do is aspirin, and then I try sometimes morphine or nitro. I don't give oxygen unless they're hypoxic. You don't, if the patient's having an, a STEMI, um, you don't want to, you, 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 I only give oxygen unless they're, they need oxygen. But it, it may vary with where you work. But um, yes, you'll just learn Mona. You'll learn about that in PA school. And then you want to repeat the EKG because EKG can ch change, you know, as the hours go by. So by the time you see the patient, the patient's been in the waiting room for like four hours and the troponin comes back elevated. So you want to repeat that EKG and see if there's now showing any EKG changes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So then you want to co consult cardiology, but this is depends on where you work. Like um, one place I work, we just call medicine to admit the patient and the patient will, will may start on Plavix, and, uh, may add Plavix to their regime. Um, and they don't always add ha um, heparin unless it's a STEMI or whatever. Yes, yeah, so cardiology. Other places I've worked, we have cardiology. It depends if they have cardiology or not. Or if they don't have cardiology and they think that this patient is going to need a stent, then we transfer them out. Um, but you will start, uh, a lot of places will start Plavix and heparin. Heparin can be low or high dose heparin. Um, a lot of places, if it's a STEMI, they'll start heparin. If it's an NSTEMI, they'll, they may also start heparin, but maybe low dose or whatever the cardiologist releases, actually. <laughs> whatever cardiologist wants, that's what they're going to do. Um, the cardiologist will also review the EKG. It will tell you what to do from there. And the patient um, will get always get some type of anticoagulant. Like I said, um, Plavix and aspirin are two like antiplatelet medications. Heparin, um, they usually start on, them on heparin too. And then the cardiologist will, will determine if the patient needs a cath. Sometimes they'll start off not needing a cath and then they'll go to cath. But usually they'll get an echo, a stress test while in the ER. Not, I'm sorry, not ER, while admitted. And um, echo stress test, then they may go to cath. And then, of course, some other lab tests. The most important thing is that, you know, you start medicating them. You have to be quick. This is somebody's heart you're talk talking about. And you have to get cardiology involved or you have to get or um, or you talk to your attending about what you think, needs, you know, about the patient. And then they'll go from there. If you're a new grad and you have a patient with chest pain and they present like they have an elevator troponin, tell your attending right away. <laughs> Don't even, you know, start medicating them on your own. Just tell your attending right away and they'll, you know, handle all, everything from there. They'll call cardiology. So, um, you know, you, you can order a repeat EKG, of course. There's no hurt in doing that. But as far as anticoagulation, watch what your attending does. Watch, you know, the conversation that he, he or she has with the cardiologist, what the cardiologist recommends for that specific case, and learn from that. That's how I learned about what to do. Every case is different. Not every not every chest pain is going to get a cath, unless, of course, it's a STEMI. I think all STEMIs go to the cath lab. 
<laughs> and if it's a really bad heart attack, go straight to the cath lab. A lot of these patients may need to be thrown out, but every patient presents differently. Every patient's gonna have different um, different um, treatment plans, um, unless it's a STEMI. <laughs> I think I've never seen a STEMI not go to the cath lab. Um, and STEMIs are a different case, and STEMIs may end up in the cath lab. The cath lab, if you guys don't know, it's um, to get um, to uh, get a step place. So if the artery is like completely closed, um, and they'll tell you the percentage of blockage, so they'll be like 90% or a full blockage or whatever. So the artery is supposed to, you know, be open. It will allow blood flow. If it's completely closed, they put a stent to try to get it open, and boom, boom, voila, blood flow. The left ascending, um, left anterior descending artery, the LAD, what they call the widowmaker, it supplies um, most of the left side of the heart, or most of the uh, breaks off to supply a lot of the areas of the heart. And that's one of the most important coronary, coronary arteries. Um, yeah, so if that's blocked, a lot, they call it the widowmaker, so you know why. I haven't had a STEMI. I mean, I've actually never had a STEMI. Everything I've been talking about um, in the case of STEMIs been, has been from what I see doctors do. I've always typically had in STEMIs because, like I said, if a patient comes in with a STEMI, that means the EKG shows a STEMI and they go straight to the doctor. They don't even wait. They go take them straight to the doctor. If it's an in STEMI, they do all this stuff and they go back, you know, sit in the you know, waiting room, but they get triaged, you know, up. Like, well, not an in STEMI, but like a chest pain. And also, um, you know, depends on the age and stuff too. But like I said, I've never had a STEMI, but every STEMI that I've seen has gone to the cath lab. Oh, heart monitor. I hope you guys know that they're immediately gonna be on the cardiac monitor. If a patient's coming, this is more um, car putting a patient on the monitor. Um, a lot of nurses should, will know to, to immediately place the patient on the monitor. So before I even come in, the patient will be on the monitor. Um, or if I don't see that, then I'll tell them to put the patient on the monitor. And if they're not, and their tribunal comes back elevated, that's one of the first things that you want to do, even as a new grad. All righty. Anything that you guys think that I miss that you want to know about chest pain related to the heart? Any questions, anything you feel that I missed or didn't explain clearly? I try to not, you know, go into too, you know, too many details about stuff. So if you guys don't know the medicine yet, or I try to tell you just enough. But let me know questions, concerns. What was what is an exception um, for? Okay, if they're if they've already taken aspirin, then you don't have to give aspirin. Or if they um, can't take aspirin, some patients can't take aspirin. Or if they're already on a blood thinner, then they um, they they and their their doctor tells them not to take aspirin. A lot of times they'll tell, tell me, oh, my doctor tells me not, I can't have aspirin, so you don't give aspirin. Or of course, if they're allergic, I know I can talk really fast sometimes. <laughs> So let me know if you need um, further explanation for anything. This goes for all PowerPoints, all presentations. I really try to explain it to you guys to where I know that you guys will understand it um, and it will stick with you. All righty, guys. Um, if you have no questions or if you do have questions, and I'll stick around a little bit in the chat. But this is it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it as usual. And I'm here if you need to dm me email me whatever if you have any questions um then yes i'm here if you need it can end stemmies lead to strokes um no that's a different um no strokes are brain and stemmies are heart if they, they, i'm not it can't lead to a stroke but if you're clotting one place you're at risk of clotting another place right so um, that's not to say an enzyme can lead to a stroke but if you have an enzyme it can be at risk of a stroke oh the chest x-ray was normal the chest x-ray is something that you just, a chest x-ray can be abnormal, but the chest x-ray was normal. But it's just a test that you have to do with all chest pain. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope um, I brought some value. Um, can you do a poll? What does that mean? I know what a poll is, but I mean, of what? <laughs> okay, I always, okay, if you guys w want me to do a poll, I'll do one on Instagram tonight. Um, like I said, here's my Instagram. So tell me what type of poll you want and, well, I don't know. So, all right, I'm going to get out over and out. Thank you so much, guys. I'll be in the chat, like I said, answering your questions. Have a good night. Um, see you next Monday, same time. Thank you again.